thank you uh, to everyone who's joining the webinar today, which is brought to you once again by the RTO ERO Foundation. My name is Mike Prentice. I am the executive director of the foundation. Uh, the mission of the RTO ERO Foundation, for those who are not familiar, is to invest in programs, research, and training to support healthy, active aging for all Canadians. Uh, but simply, we envision a society in which all seniors live with dignity and respect. Uh, before we get started, Deanna, if you can pop up the uh, land acknowledgement, we're just going to take a minute for our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge, recognize, and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work, and the contributions of all Indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. Nous reconnaissons et honorons les territoires traditionnels ancestraux sur lesquels nous vivons et travaillons, ainsi que la contribution de tous les peuples autochtones à nos communautés et à notre nation. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Thanks, Diana. And thanks to Suzette Poudreau-Gagnon, who is our RTO Aero member and a member of our board, actually, for reading uh, our land acknowledgement in both languages. Thank you, Suzette. Okay, today is very exciting for us. Uh, it's the first time we're bringing you a webinar in a panel discussion format. Um, October is RTO ERO Foundation's Social Isolation Awareness Month campaign. And so we're very pleased and very grateful to be able to kick off the, a month of activity uh, with this really special panel discussion. Um, for the folks in the audience, you can pose a question at any time during this webinar. We ask you please use the Q&A button. You'll see it either on the bottom or maybe on the side of your screen, depending on your device, we will get to our aim today is to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. Uh, today's webinar is titled moving from isolation to inclusion. So our aim for today is to spend a little less time talking about the issue of social isolation. We've done a few webinars in the past couple of years on the issue on the problem of isolation and loneliness. We'd like to spend most of our discussion today focused on strategies and solutions. And we want today to be about our collective response to the problem and how to move forward. So we have three, and I, uh, uh, I do not say this lightly, incredible guests on our panel. Uh, you're seeing on screen, I think right now, everyone you should be seeing, Dr. Samir Sinha, Dr. Rachel Savage, and Dr. Raza Mirza. Welcome, a huge thank you to the three of you for be being with us today. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to take a, a quick few minutes just to uh, introduce the three of you. Please jump in and correct me if I get any of this wrong, as I always say. So I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Raza Mirza is the Director of National Partnerships and Knowledge Mobilization at HelpAge Canada. It is an Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto's Factor Inwintash Faculty of Social Work Institute for Life Course and Aging. Uh, Dr. Mirza's areas of expertise and teaching interests include medical decision making, the socio-behavioral determinants of health, in persons aging with a chronic illness, aging in place, and factors such as isolation, social isolation, and loneliness influencing late life uh, mental and physical well being. Um, our second panelist, which you're seeing, I'm seeing in my top left, but you're seeing somewhere in the, in the Hollywood Square, is Dr. Rachel Savage. Dr. Savage is a scientist at Women's Age Lab and Women's College Research Institute, Women's College Hospital, and an adjunct scientist at ICES, and an assistant professor at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at U of T. Uh, at Women's Age Lab, Dr. Savage leads research focused on promoting social connectedness in older adults and supporting aging in place. She is a principal investigator of a national study that aims to understand how isolation and loneliness impact the ways in which older adults use healthcare services. Uh, and our third panelist today is Dr. Samir Sinha. Dr. Sinha is the Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health System and the University Health Network in Toronto and a Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto. And he is the Director of Health Policy Research at Toronto Metropolitan University's National Institute on Aging, the NIA. Uh, Dr. Sinha is a highly regarded clinician and international expert in the care of older adults. He is also the architect of the Government of Ontario's senior strategy, and in 2014, Maclean's proclaimed him to be one of Canada's 50 most influential people and its most compelling voice for the elderly. 
So uh, if I got any of that wrong, folks, please feel free to jump in or correct me or add to it if you'd like. But I think it's pretty clear from those snippets of uh, our three expert bios why we have these three on this panel today. So Dr. Mirza, Dr. Savage, Dr. Sinha have in fact, um, you've all been guest presenters for our webinars in the past. We're so grateful the three of you uh, volunteered your time, taken time out of your uh, very busy schedules to be with us today. Um, welcome again, the three of you. Thank you so much for being with us today again. So I'm gonna say a few more things and then I'm gonna to move to questions and I will stop talking, I promise. So October, as mentioned, is uh, the foundation, our Social Isolation Awareness Month. We've been doing this for a few years. Um, social isolation, we know, is an issue across many ages and demographics. Um, but isolation and loneliness, as it affects older adults specifically, is something we at the foundation have made a focus area, a priority for our programming and our work. Um, and that includes content we generate, webinars such as this, uh, and the types of projects that we fund through our grant program. So as mentioned earlier, we'd like to keep today, we will keep today focused on solutions and strategies um, on, uh, on moving forward to start solving the problem of isolation and loneliness. So maybe I'll just level set everyone. You know, we don't want to assume everyone's an expert in this area. We know not everybody is. We have three experts with us today for exactly that reason. But let me say a few quick words about the issue just to set up what the issue is so then we can start um, talking about solutions and strategies. I will say for anyone who's interested to learn more on this issue, a really great place to start is a recently published report. It's called Understanding Social Isolation and Loneliness Among Older Canadians and How to Address It. So this report was created uh, and published by our friends at the NIA the National Institute on Aging, where Dr. Sinha is the Director of Health Policy Research, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Deanna, if you can add a link in the chat box right now, if you don't mind, or at some point, uh, uh, you know, uh, soon, um, we'd encourage everyone to download the report, take a look at it, uh, spend some time going through it. It's a very important and very thorough report about isolation and loneliness among older adults. And it was, in fact, uh, that report was funded uh, by us at the foundation, in part by us at the foundation through our donor supported grant program. So thank you to anyone who's on the webinar today who is a donor or supporter of the foundation. I'm going to read, Dr. Sinha, if you don't mind, I'm going to read from the report briefly just to set sort of level set all of us. Uh, and this is from the NIA report I just mentioned. Social isolation and loneliness are increasingly recognized as important public health concerns. Globally, as well as in Canada, these issues have significant implications for the health and well being of older persons. Older adults are at increased risk of experiencing social isolation and loneliness and are especially vulnerable to their negative impacts. With older persons making up a rapidly growing proportion of Canada's population, the number of either isolated or lonely older adults is also expected to increase, meaning that both the individual and societal consequences of loneliness and social isolation are expected to become more severe. As such, it is important to fully understand the prevalence and consequences of social isolation and loneliness in Canada and to work to implement effective evidence-based strategies to reduce their impacts and better support healthy aging. I think it's a perfect summary for just the problem at a high level. So we could easily spend an hour talking about the problem. We all do uh, uh, very often. It's what we uh, spend a lot of our professional lives doing. But again, we wanna focus today on discussion uh, around solutions. So I'm gonna ask each of our panelists just to start the discussion, get it rolling. I'm just gonna ask sort of a high level question of, of each of you, and then we'll open up questions to the audience. Again, from an audience perspective, please feel free to pop in a question, use the Q&A button anytime. And we'll sort of formally open up that Q&A section very shortly. So, Dr. Savage, may I start with you, um, sure. if you don't mind? So could you please share with us um, some of your thoughts, some of your recommendations maybe on what we can do, what we can start thinking about at a societal level to start addressing the problem of loneliness and isolation among older adults? Yeah, thanks, Mike, for that question. I think it's a really important one. Um, so I'm going to maybe throw out three ideas that I think are, are important when we're thinking about loneliness at a societal level. I think here in Canada, we have a lot of opportunities. The first is 
to change the way we, so collectively, think and talk about loneliness. The second point I'll make is I think we need to be promoting and building age-friendly communities. And then the third point I want to raise is the importance of intersectoral collaborations. So maybe to go back to my first point, changing the way that we think and talk about loneliness. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware that there is a stigma associated with loneliness. Research has found that nearly three quarters of people say that when they felt lonely, they haven't told anyone about it. And other parts of the world have been trying to tackle this stigma of loneliness through national campaigns, raising awareness, sharing stories of loneliness. Uh, so there's the Let's Talk Loneliness campaign in the UK. You probably haven't heard anything in Canada, and that's because we haven't had a, a similar campaign. So I think addressing stigma is really important um, because it, it worsens the experience of being lonely, first off, and then second, it makes it harder for people to reach out and seek help if they need it. Um, and I think as we start bringing loneliness into the spotlight, we need to also be moving away from talking about loneliness as an issue that individuals are responsible for tackling themselves or that, you know, it's things that are controllable or within the power of someone necessarily to do. Um, I think most of us, you know, when we experience loneliness, it's caused by external and largely uncontrollable social determinants. So, you know, major cha changes in, in life transition. So losing a partner, for example, having to care for a family member or, you know, living alone, um, experiencing discrimination, having a health issue or experiencing a disability. So these are all examples of events that can trigger feelings of loneliness that aren't necessarily controllable for individuals. So I think we need to be sharing this message more freely so people don't feel that they're necessarily to blame for their loneliness. And you know, we can be shifting the focus more so on how we change structural, environmental, and cultural factors that lead to loneliness. So to go back to my second point, promoting and building age-friendly communities, I think, um, you know, how communities are designed can either promote or prevent older adults from remaining socially connected as they age. Um, and this is especially important for older adults who spend more time in their neighborhoods than other age groups. So communities that strengthen people's social networks have a few common things. Um, they have access to amenities, they have safe and affordable housing, they have transportation, uh, safe and walkable neighborhoods, green spaces um, and communal public spaces. And this concept of third places, so places outside of our home or work where we can have conversations and social interactions like uh, sporting clubs, social clubs, libraries, parks, cafes, these are all really important um, for building communities that strengthen these social ties. And then the last point I wanted to make was around supporting intersectoral co collaboration. So, you know, that there's so many different causes for loneliness and the pathways to it are quite complex. So I think there's agreement that no one sector alone can address this issue. And this is where partnerships become really important. Um, intersectoral partnerships go beyond sectors. Um, they bring distinct and diverse uh, viewpoints together to address complex problems. Again, in other parts of the world, there have been loneliness action groups or coalitions that have been formed that are dedicated to building these relationships. And we don't have a similar infrastructure here yet in Canada. And so um, here at Women's College, we're piloting an intersectoral uh, collaboration dedicated to bringing diverse uh, partners together to share ideas, solutions, and, and to start building that network. So those are kind of some three ideas at a societal level from me. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Savage. Um, okay, uh, a question for Dr. Mirza. Um, similar question to what was just asked of uh, Dr. Savage and answered so, so, so fulsomely. But from an individual perspective, so rather than sort of a sort of a higher societal level, 
what can we do? What can we start thinking about um, as individuals to start addressing this problem, to start uh, affecting change uh, in our communities, in our families? Thank you so much, Mike and Deanna, for this opportunity to talk about this very important issue. And I would say that this is a tough question to ask, you know, what, what can an individual do? Because a lot of the factors that really lead to social isolation, as Dr. Savage has suggested, are really extrinsic, extrinsic to the individual. But I would say that, you know, I'm going to overlap on one of the points to say that we need to learn to talk about social isolation in different ways. Like we need to talk about it in the ways that people experience social isolation. And I would say that one of the byproducts of the pandemic is that more and more of us experience what it feels like to be socially isolated and what it actually looks like to be socially, socially isolated. So it's a great opportunity for us to have this conversation. And again, also to suggest that there's this pathway, like we don't just become socially isolated overnight. There's a pathway which suggests that there's opportunities for us to address social isolation along the way. And so to build on the point that Dr. Savage had suggested, which is, well, we need to really sort of reframe social isolation because right now it's sort of stigmatized and it's stigmatized because there's so many ways that people can remain connected right now. So many ways that people can remain engaged, especially with leveraging technology that oftentimes that the individual in sort of takes the blame onto themselves to suggest that it's some failing on their part that led them to become isolated. And, and what we know is that's not necessarily the case here. So I think that that's part of this is really reframing the conversation about social isolation and talking about it in a way that, you know, people are experiencing it. Now, one of the things that I'll tell you is that, you know, I became a lot more conscious of my own social support network and the mutual aid that's required as an individual for me as I grow older, and a surprising number that I read, um, you know, in preparation for this talk, and also just thinking about social isolation is that on average, people have about five contacts that they can reach out to if they're in crisis or if they need support or if they'd like to be able to share some good news. And actually I was surprised because I thought that was a high number. And so when we see numbers like that out there and people can't reach that expectation, it also becomes difficult to talk about social isolation. And in the alternative to the fact that people aren't talking about social isolation, studies also find that when people do talk about social isolation, they talk about it with frontline service providers, they talk about it with their friends, they talk about it with clinicians, but they don't say I'm socially isolated. They suggest other things that potentially the person has to be able to pick up on and respond to. And so we have to equip the people around all of us to be able to respond to and pick up on these sorts of things. So I think, I think that's just an overlap from Dr. Savage's points as well. Um, I think the other individual pieces that we can do is really to take care of our physical health as an individual, you know, some of that responsibility for managing our physical health and really preparing for an older version of ourselves is very key, I think, to addressing some of the risk factors that can be exacerbated and lead to social isolation. And with regards to physical health, I'll also say that, you know, social isolation can lead to declines in physical health and poor physical health can also lead to social isolation. So I think those are a couple of key things for us to really be conscious of. And one of the things that we've seen with regards to physical health is hearing loss actually becomes a very big trigger for people disengaging from social settings because you know they might seem confused or might feel embarrassed by the fact that their their hearing is declining and they don't want to wear a hearing aid for example because that makes them feel older or look older and so hearing loss is again one of those things that if we address it early enough can sort of slow down the pathway towards or even stop the pathway to social isolation a couple other quick points i think really what we've seen again using the pandemic as a backdrop is this very quick accelerated move towards you know more and more of a digital society so i think as individuals we we really need to focus on our digital literacy and i think digital literacy will give people the the capacity and confidence to engage in society and the digital economy in the ways that it is moving forward so you know whether it's banking or grocery or even virtual visits the people who are at risk for isolation might also not have the capacity to engage in the digital economy in those ways. But you know, the alternative to that again is that there's a third of older adults that don't have access to digital technology, don't have access to the internet, you know, depending on where you're living. So this is becoming increasingly problematic, and we're seeing the digital di divide increase this way. And then, you know, finally, I'll say that 
you know, and I'm really proud of the work that's happening at the Women's Age Lab because I think that we as individuals need to focus on the older women in our lives. I think that, you know, that's been the focus of this year's International Day of the Older Person as well, is to say that, you know, older women are at a greater risk of social isolation. So as an, as an individual, we should take greater responsibility for the older women in our lives. And we can see some of those life course transitions that have been mentioned as being super problematic for um, older women, especially living alone, living in poverty, potentially in caregiving situations. And so these are places, again, that we can intervene with solutions. And so, you know, I think the final thing that I'll say is that if you are feeling isolated, I think you also need to be gentle with yourself and just really recognize the fact that there is a lot of factors that work towards leading people to be isolated and it's not your fault. So I'll leave it with that and thank you so much. Thank you. So, so, so many insights and thoughts in a, in a short period of time. Thank you very much. Um, finally, or finally for this portion, Dr. Sinha, this question is for you. Um, and then we'll move uh, after uh, we give Dr. Sinha a few minutes to speak, we'll move on to just opening up to Q&A. We already see a few in the queue. So, um, so Dr. Sinha, we know that this issue of um, social engagement for older adults is not a, you know, it's not a unique discussion in Canada. It's actually something that many countries and cultures are working on. Can you share from your perspective and experience, can you share with us, you know, one or two or of the more innovative or promising initiatives that you've seen from other parts of the world to start addressing this, this uh, issue? Yeah, so thank you very much, Mike. And, and again, thanks for hosting us, uh, hosting us today. I think um, my, my two colleagues, Dr. Mirza and Dr. Dr. Savage have really kind of helped outline, you know, things that we can do at a practical level, such as raising awareness, you know, combating stigma, but also giving more people the opportunities just to get together and build their networks and to strengthen their networks as well. And so when we look at what other countries have done, I think Dr. Savage mentioned, you, you don't see campaigns around this in Canada because we don't actually have a national strategy to combat social isolation and loneliness. But, you know, there are four other major countries that we profiled in our in our NI report, such as Japan, um, such as the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, which have taken real neat national approaches to, to combating these, these issues. I mean, the UK has gone as far as actually creating a minister responsible for loneliness to try and really elevate the idea that this is a, a major public health issue. Um, while things like smoking, for example, are, are kind of on, on the downtrend, for example, we know that there'll be more people living with isolation and loneliness in our society, especially as our population ages. So this is a growing public health challenge, but it's also one that can be can be solved. And, and we've, we've heard about a few of the issues here. So some of the things that have really been focused on when you look at what these other countries have done is number one, really create national campaigns and national awareness around what loneliness and isolation is. So people can help label it, they can identify it, but they also know that, it, that, that we can destigmatize this as well. Because the first key is just to identify that someone might be experiencing this. Um, and therefore it's important to kind of reach out to friends and family to let them know, um, or your healthcare professional so that they can help you start thinking about ways in which you can strengthen your network um, and, and become um, an experience less loneliness and, and social isolation. One really cool initiative, for example, that they, they do in the UK is that uh, every year they go to a few different cities, for example, um, and they started uh, one kind of initiative in, in the city of Wirral in, 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 the, in, um, in the northwest of England, where they did the great door knock, if you will, where literally they had teams of volunteers who literally knocked on every door in the community to talk to talk to residents around loneliness and social isolation and help identify people who might not be well connected and therefore being able to kind of finish the day by helping to strengthen connections and making sure that people who were lonely or isolated and self-identified were able to be connected better to local so supports and services to grow that that's one idea and that was one great initiative that that is found um um, you know, um, um, some last where it's been occurring kind of every year in, in, in different communities, for example. Um, 
other things that, you know, there are other form, more formal programs, formal programs that really help support um, community organizations um, uh, and, uh, and others to help uh, find ways to connect people together. So by creating more experiences around common interests that bring people together, um, people are able to create new connections and new um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and make new contacts and friends so that, you know, as Dr. Mirza was saying, instead of saying, I only have one other person or no other person I can contact, I've actually now made a friend and I've actually started to rebuild my social network as I age. Um, and one of the ways in which we can start bringing that into policy is, is, is for example, in Ontario. So back in 2013, when we, when we decided that we want to tackle a few of these issues at the same time, social isolation, loneliness, but also um, the issue of falls, um, and uh, and uh, as, as a major problem, we created um, 2,000 free exercise and falls prevention classes around Ontario. We want to make them barrier free. We want to make sure that they were in places where where older people, in particular, could gather pretty easily. So maybe um, at one's local place of worship, for example, or at a local shopping center. And these would be run by community organizations, for example. And there was a twofold purpose by creating, uh, by making this a low barrier um, opportunity, we would probably gather people together interested in false prevention, but we knew the indirect benefit of this program was, you know, by having people come together, you might make a new friend um, and you might make a new connection or contact um, or get to know an organization that has other activities of interest that could get you better connected um, and, uh, and, and help therefore combat social isolation and loneliness. So it's about thinking about these opportunities where, you know, what are the things that we're doing and, and how do we do it? But the one big thing in our report that we really spoke about is one of the ways in which we can actually better disseminate good ideas and good practice is by having common ways of measuring what loneliness and social isolation is so that we can better evaluate the effectiveness of of interventions. Right now, there's so many different things that have happened in Canada um, on a one-off basis, for example, but because different ways of measuring the impact actually exist, there's different scales to measure loneliness and social isolation, it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison. So one of the things that we talked about in our report is not only do we have to have a, a bit of a national strategy here in Canada, but we should have common ways of measuring the impact of what we're doing so we know where we're getting the most bang for our buck and, and what is most impactful uh, with our efforts, especially if we want to rob and duplicate good ideas uh, from other jurisdictions. It's better to also figure out whether or not that might be a worthwhile investment um, and is it really having the effect we want as well. So that's just some insights from what we're seeing in other parts of the world, um, but certainly other jurisdictions are leading um, in trying to tackle this and, and, uh, and certainly there's some good things we can learn from others in terms of how we can shape a Canadian response to these two key issues. Thank you, Dr. Sinha. Thank you. So a, a lot to learn from what's already being uh, done and being attempted, at least, and not necessarily having to reinvent the wheel or start from scratch, right, um, with every intervention or every strategy. Uh, thank you to the to the three of you for those uh, great uh, responses to those uh, to the to the questions we put out. So we're going to open up the Q and A portion of the webinar now. We've got a half an hour left in, in the hour, which is great. So just a reminder to everyone in the audience: please use the Q and A button to submit your questions. If you would like your question directed at someone in particular on the panel, feel free to indicate that uh, in in the wording of your question, or of course just pose it generally to the panel. So we have a always have a very highly interested and highly engaged. A crowd, I would say, for these webinars, and that means there are already a number of questions in the queue. So let's get into answering some of those. If I may uh, ask our panelists, we'll try and keep maybe responses to like one or two or three minutes for each question, and that way we'll just get to as many audience questions as possible because there's already quite a few uh, as predicted. So that's great. So let me start. Um, maybe I'll put this one out to just the panel, and if somebody wants to jump in uh, and take it, I'll. I'll I'll pose this sort of broadly to all three of you. There's a question about um, uh, just talk about issues specific to the LGBTQ plus community or LGBTQ plus seniors 
uh, and aging and social isolation, the connection between those two things, if there are particular um, insights or strategies or sort of thoughts that anyone has uh, in, in that area. Does anybody have, you know, a thought or an insight or something on that? I can, I can start. And um, so one of our research fellows at the NIA, Dr. Ashley Flanagan, um, this is our area of focus around diversity and aging and, and, and some of these, some of these aspects, because we know, especially um, um, if you might be a, an older LGBTQ senior, um, you may have um, outlived family members and friends. Um, you may not have, um, um, you know, th those traditional networks that other people may actually have. So there's an increase risk within this particular population um, for experiencing loneliness and social isolation. So this is where we talk about the importance of kind of how do we kind of build community? And I think Dr. Mirza talked about, um, um, you know, digital um, connectivity as well, because we know for some people who might be living in more rural and remote communities, for example, it may be harder to access services and supports and, and, and a physical community one can keep. Can, can communicate with. So certainly there are some organizations that are trying through AGAL Canada and others that are trying to actually build, you know, kind of more digital networks and supports, you know, to help people across the country. But then also thinking about how do we how do we better support people living uh, more in urban areas to again find ways in which they can be, be become better connected, you know, to either either members of their own community or or to the general community at all. But we do know it's a bigger issue, um, especially for older LGBTQ populations, but also other specific populations. Um, and that's why we need to, whatever we are doing, we need to make sure that our initiatives are as inclusive as possible. Um, and they are specifically thinking about the unique needs, um, um, uh, you know, to, to create, you know, um, you know, kind of appropriate and, and, and culturally safe uh, um, uh, programming and supports as well. Thanks, Dr. Sinha, thank you. Um, I'm looking through the questions and there's a bit of a theme emerging, so I'll try to sort of pull that out if we see it. There are quite a few questions on some aspect of um, the issue of ageism, uh, ageism sort of broadly in our society, which I think we're all pretty aware of as a, as a sort of a separate but very connected problem. So maybe Rachel or Raza, do you want to speak, uh, one or both of you, on sort of how those things are interconnected? I think you've both kind of touched on it a little bit in terms of stigma and things like that, but specifically around ageism and the connection with social isolation and loneliness. Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, yes, thanks for uh, those of you that raised that point. I, again, I think it's a really important one. Um, so sometimes as, as well, like I think there's ageism that we, like you're experiencing the discrimination, but then there's also the experience of sort of internalizing that discrimination and sort of, um, you know, feeling that way or uh, about yourself. And, and so I think sometimes this is where there can be some intersections with, with loneliness. When you're feeling lonely, it can sometimes go into this downward spiral where you feel like people don't want to see, like, be friends with you or that you're not, you know, worthy of that kind of support and affection. And so I think, you know, it's sort of trying to be aware of those things and, and recognize the issues for, for what they are. Um, but I, I think the intersection with ageism and, and loneliness is important because obviously if we're not creating opportunities for older adults to be included in society as really important members, then we're going to be contributing to, to social isolation and to feelings of loneliness. So I think going back to that concept of age-friendly communities, we really need to be creating opportunities for older adults to continue to be included um, as members of, of valuable members of society throughout the life course. And um, there were some really nice examples, I think in the Q&A of some um, opportunities to do that intergenerational programs and educational activities are really, really important. Um, and bringing social supports to older adults where they age is also, again, really important volunteer opportunities 
um, opportunities to engage in the mentoring of others and sharing that wisdom and life experience. Um, and then I think too, there's a lot that needs to be done to tackle ageism sort of in the same way that we need to do a lot with loneliness. A lot of people don't know what it is. Um, and, you know, it's kind of one of the last like socially acceptable, it seems like forms of discrimination. Um, and it really shouldn't be. And older women in particular have that sort of double-edged sword of the intersection of ageism and, um, and sexism. So we call that gendered ageism, which can, you know, limit opportunities for them even further and create barriers to inclusion. So um, I think we need to be as well raising the awareness of what ageism is, how it impacts people, and how we can combat it as a society. If, Thanks, I could, if I could just quickly build on that, I'll just say that, you know, when we think about people in our communities who feel included, they feel as if though they have a social role. And I would say that in our communities, especially, I would say, even prior to the pandemic, and now we're, we're increasingly living in, in an age segregated or age divided communities and society. And so this is super problematic, because, you know, when we think about that number that I, I read about and I talked about earlier that you have five social contacts that you can reach out to in a matter of a crisis or if you have good news to share. Oftentimes those that number actually includes people of the same age as you and what we see is that there is a limited opportunity for intergenerational engagement. And I think that that's one of the ways that we can address ageism is by creating more opportunities for intergenerational engagement and for people to learn about the different you know things that people from all ages can contribute to one another. And you know, the thing I'll ask people to reflect on is to think about where you met your friends, where you were able to pick up people who were part of your network now. And if you think about it, it's probably at school, it's probably through recreation activities, it's probably through your workplace. And increasingly, as you get older, you're excluded from those spaces or because of ageist attitudes or societal stereotypes, older adults are not potentially feeling welcome in those spaces and places. And so we're limiting the opportunities for people to not only engage with one another, but also to expand their networks. And this is something that Dr. Sinha had previously talked about as, as and has mentioned as well, is that as we get older, we really should think about adding new friends to our social support networks and to our, our networks and the people that we engage with. But I think really what it comes down to is ageism limits our opportunities to expand our social networks and to operate in the spaces and places where we could make new friends and, and, and new confidants. And so I would say that that's the part there and intergenerational engagement might be one of the ways forward for us. Very wise. Thanks, Dr. Mirza. Thank you. Um, Looking through the questions when there's so many in here. Uh, okay, so we'll get, again, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, there also, I'm seeing a handful of questions related to the pandemic and COVID, of course. So again, everyone feel free to sort of jump in, but maybe um, Dr. Sinha, I'll pose this one to you. I know a lot of uh, your effort, certainly in the last couple of years, has been devoted to issues that arose through the, through the, um, COVID pandemic. So I'll just read this question. Uh, how does one come out of the isolation that we have experienced in COVID? Being an active person in the past, I find it difficult to manage how to break out of COVID isolation while still practicing mature decisions about how to handle COVID. So what, what do folks do? We know, we talk to folks all the time who are struggling with this. I'm sure the three of you do as well. So, I mean, that great, great discussion on sort of individually solutions and strategies we can take to try and break out of this sort of isolation situation we've all found ourselves in yeah i think we i think a lot of us have grappled with different kind of levels of isolation and and loneliness during the pandemic i mean one thing we saw um early on and and we've done some research around this and, and put this as part of our, our our report was that during the pandemic you know people of all ages experienced um, significant increases in isolation and loneliness um as well especially more so younger people than than older people but, you know, people have experienced things in different ways. You know, we know people who couldn't visit their loved ones who might have been in a long term care retirement home. We know that people who, as we were just uh, this person has written in, maybe be a person living in their own home in the community and and therefore restricted a lot of their movements, for example, because they just want to be careful and, and don't want to get COVID. But now that we're being told as of 
this past spring that you know things are the restrictions are lifting you know and, and that now people are free to kind of maneuver as they want i think most of us are also well aware that the pandemic isn't over um that 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 we're we're now starting to see an uptick in cases and numbers again um and i think people are getting more nervous about navigating you know public spaces or or being invited to gatherings for example where not many people might be adhering towards things and and so how do you navigate that I think certainly, um, I think the key is is to stay aware of, of what the risks are out there. I mean, we've talked about the importance of people getting vaccinated and maximizing one's own personal protection. But one of the things that we developed at the NIA that's been supported by the Public Health Agency of Canada, and I can certainly add into the chat is our covidvisitrisk.com um, tool. It's an online tool. So um, if you've been able to make it onto the webinar, um, you can go to this website um, and, uh, and it's a handy tool that people of all ages can use um, to kind of evaluate a potential situation they might be going to and evaluating what are the ways in which they can they can potentially navigate it more safely um, depending on the level of risk associated with that potential um, gathering or, um, or, or that. Um, because I think, you know, if, if you are feeling a bit nervous, you're not alone. I think a lot of people are starting to feel um, um, quite nervous as they're navigating new social situations. Um, but I think they're, I think, armed with information, um, knowing that one is vaccinated, knowing that one is, um, that is, is still doing Doing things that they feel would keep them safe um, are all ways in which we can try and uh, and 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 to respect yourself, to recognize that, um, to and and to work at your own pace, um, and to share with other people if you're feeling a bit nervous, because often they can sometimes figure out ways to help further make you feel welcome and accommodate you so that you're not so isolated um, and feeling you have to choose uh, on whether or not you want to get together with others. So it's a really good question because I think this is a real thing that many people are experiencing. Um, but certainly these are just some of the ideas of how one can better navigate that as well. Thanks, Dr. Sinaf. Um, here's an interesting question. It, there's a sort of a specific example and then maybe a, a sort of more general uh, question about the role, and I think the three of you in, in, have already sort of touched on this on some level, the role of other older adults in sort of, uh, you know, uh, I'm assisting or being part of the solution for their peers and friends who may be experiencing isolation and loneliness. Here's the, here's the example and a question. In Zimbabwe, they are training older women in talk therapy to help people with loneliness and environmental trauma. They call it grandmother therapy. Can we tap into the abilities of older people who are wise and competent? Yeah, I love this comment. Maybe I'll jump in with one example of how we're doing um, that at women's. So, and I know there's been some comments too about digital literacy and opportunities and building literacy, especially with older women um, and those living in retirement homes. So, um, you know, increasingly we're turning to virtual healthcare solutions. And most of you have probably engaged with your healthcare provider through a video visit or a telephone visit. And we've started to recognize that a lot of the patients don't really have the tools to, to connect this way. And so we're piloting a program to build digital literacy for our older patients here at Women's. And um, one of the ways that we want to also um, you know, promote social interaction and togetherness through this initiative is inviting older adults who are digital digitally literate to be peer support coaches in this program. So they're gonna be involved in helping us set the curriculum, in designing how the format of the, this program, um, and in providing hands-on support to their peers who are um, participants in this, in this workshop. So I 100% agree, we need to be taking advantage and working with older adults who have a lot of unique skills and, and um, expertise that they wanna give back and share. And volunteering is one of the best ways you can address loneliness at an individual level. The more you can help others, and it brings together opportunities to connect and um, sort of opens up that social network that we've been talking about. So um, just to say that I, I really think that was a fantastic comment. 
Thanks, Dr. Savage. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the digital digital literacy because yeah, we're seeing that pop up in the chat and in a lot of the questions around digital literacy and that is sort of a a, um, a barrier for a lot of folks. Um, Dr. Mirza, I'm going to pose this question to you again. Everyone, feel free to jump in, but I, I think this is an interesting question because it speaks a bit to the point you made, um, Dr. Mirza, about uh, the pathway, what you called the pathway. So uh, this person in the audience has said sometimes there is uh, we have an inability to accept our own aging body in our youth oriented society and what will be a growing weakness or a dependency as we continue to age admitting loneliness is like admitting weakness and nobody wants to be pitied or feel ashamed. So there's sort of a statement in there, but I guess the question around that is sort of, and you, I think you touched on this from an individual level. You, know, you said, you know, be kind to yourself, but, you know, for folks who maybe are on the pathway, but don't realize they are, um, what, what, what do we do? I think that's a great question as well. And, you know, some of the literature is going to support this idea that people are afraid to present themselves in a way where they say, I got to this point of being lonely, or I got to this point of being isolated. And what really what we have to focus on is recognizing the things that lead to loneliness or isolation that are extrinsic to that individual and really not about them. Re really, it's not usually a personal circumstance that they are in control of. And Dr. Savage mentioned this as well. So I think there's that part. And it also goes back to the point about ageism. We do live in this society where people are afraid to wear their hearing aids because, well, my employer might discriminate against me. My friend group might make fun of me because, you know, I'm only 48 and I'm using a hearing aid already and I'm, I'm too young to be doing that. So these are the ways that, you know, people sort of avoid these things that are potentially related to an older age and an older age sometimes represents this very negative notion in society. And so that's this sort of pathway that we, that leads to the other issues being exacerbated further. You know, if you don't wear your hearing aid and you don't get your vision tested, you could potentially lose your driver's license, you know, and if you don't start continue to engage with people and go to the gym, et cetera, your physical health can decline. And over time, you know, people start, you, you worry that people will stop inviting you out, et cetera. So all of these, these issues are sort of entangled with one another. And in the NIA report as well, I think there's a very helpful diagram where they talk about the intrinsic and extrinsic factors that really people should focus on. And so again, it is about recognizing uh, that, you know, with aging, there comes certain changes. I think if I can just very quickly talk about a theory, the theory is selective optimization with compensation, that as we get older, we really need to focus on our strengths and really sort of optimize and compensate for some of the changes that are happening within us. And so, um, you know, for example, if you do have hearing loss and you want to wear a hearing aid, there are different ways that you can wear one that's going to be a little bit more discreet, or you can use an app on your phone to help you with your hearing. So there's different ways of optimizing and compensating for some of the losses that people might face in, in their life. But to really recognize that addressing the hearing issue does address the risk factor for becoming isolated um, later in life as well. So I think that's the way I answer that, but it's a great question. So thank you. It is, yeah, and it's a tough one. Um, so this, here's a question I'm just seeing, and it's, it's a little bit similar to the, I think to the last question, but, but different. So I'm just gonna read this one. By definition, socially isolated people are hard to find. How do communities identify, reach out, and engage the socially isolated? Uh, Dr. Senna, you provided a great example uh, from the UK. Um, so here, you know, without uh, sort of, sort of de design government programs, or if you live in a community where those programs don't exist, maybe, or, or don't, aren't yet in place, um, how do we find, how do we reach, how do we help the folks that might be experiencing isolation and loneliness? Rachel or Samir wants to maybe take that one. If you don't mind, I'll start very quickly oh, sure. with just a quick um, observation from a, a research study that we conducted with the NIA and the City of Toronto. We were looking at the Kensington Chinatown area and looking at socially isolated older adults and it was a language barrier issue that was leading to isolation. And an interesting observation and you know I'll tell you that this was a question that we really wrestled with for a long time. The isolated person is going to be hard to find. How will we find these isolated and lonely older adults? And actually we didn't find them. Who we found were the people that they had surrounded themselves with and this is the point that I was trying to allude to earlier. And it was that social support network that they had or their social network that 
saw them missing from the Mahjong games, that saw them missing from their regular dinner club, that saw them missing from the lottery terminals or the bank teller recognized them as not being there. And so what, I, what I'll highlight and before I hand it off to Dr. Sinha and Dr. Savage is that it was these sort of routine engagements that people were participating in that when they weren't there, other people noticed and other people intervened. And the point that really was problematic at that point, at that time was when those people became aware of the fact that this person was isolated, lonely, and missing from these sort of social settings, they didn't know what to do. That was the other big challenge there. So, Yeah, so just building on, on what Dr. Mirza said was that uh, part of our goal is to always try and look at how do we how do we identify people um, and in, in a variety of different ways? So in Denmark, for example, one of the things they do is once you turn um, the age of 80, you'll get an annual knock on your door from a local community um, a home care nurse, for example. Um, and they're just checking in um, to see how you're doing. Um, you know, any major changes? Um, are you feeling lonely or isolated? Because that's kind of a window in. Again, by doing that, that standardized door knocking to see if there are ways that they can better connect you. Um, as uh, Dr. Mirza was saying, you know, there's another great way of, 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 you know, helping people to be able to report in if they have a loved one or friend who might be um, also um, missing from things and, and therefore needs help being connected. I think the key is it's, it's also about making sure that a local community response can be coordinated so that are there organizations for example who can take this information and therefore have a variety of programs or responses that can find the right fit to help get that person better connected and so it's one thing to help identify people it's another thing to not have the programs to respond so i don't know if dr savage for example might want to respond to that yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Sinha and Dr. Mirza have raised some really um, good points. I mean, I've been struggling with this issue too as a researcher because how I identify lonely older adults in data is those that are willing to say that they feel lonely. And that's a big issue too. And, and of course there's some gendered roles and norms related to that, that you know, women are more likely uh, to admit to the feelings of loneliness than, than men traditionally. Although I think that is changing and will change the more that we start talking about it. So I think it's a big challenge for health researchers. How do we identify these individuals? And then for thinking about interventions and getting them to the people that need them, it's really, you know, challenging as well. I will say that, you know, the point earlier that was made that older adults are more likely to disclose those feelings to healthcare providers. You know, so many people have access to a primary care physician and initiatives that improve access will go a long way to making sure that people have some form of connection to the healthcare system and to some of those, you know, social support. So I think that's a really worthwhile endeavor, just ensuring that people have access to that, uh, you know, support person. And of course, in primary care, there's a bit more of a relational, you know, nature where you feel close to the, your provider, they know you. Um, and I, I think that's a, a really important avenue. You. Thank you to the three of you for uh, addressing that question. Intergenerational co-housing and cooperatives can profoundly interrupt social isolation. We need more government support for these kinds of housing. Does the panel have any suggestions for how to advocate the federal government in particular to support these housing initiatives? Thanks so much. And, you know, we've been working in partnership with Dr. Sinha, the NIA and others to really promote this intergenerational and co-housing initiative called Canada Home Share. And I think the way that we really have to start to think about the ways that co-housing and home sharing can interrupt social isolation is to look at it in the context of things like aging in place. Do we want people simply to be aging in place or do we want them to be thriving in place and for them to be thriving in place programs like this one can address things like ageism isolation quality of life giving them a social role and purpose so i think that this is really important and i think that when we start to think about co-housing and intergenerational home sharing and other things we also have to start thinking about this movement that is very important for addressing social isolation which is social prescribing and this becomes, you know, and I hate to say this, but it becomes one of the prescriptions that clinicians can use to connect the community and the institutional settings where we could potentially identify an older adult who's at risk for 
for social isolation. So I think that these programs are very, very important. I do think that they need to be on the, the radar for the provincial governments and for the federal governments, but really as part of programming that focuses on aging in place and things like social prescribing. And uh, I'll, I'll hand it off to my colleagues if, to add any additional thoughts on that. Well, maybe just to add that I think it's so important that we try to engage government and decision makers in some of the partnered work that we're doing, like through the intersectoral collaborations and, you know, in other places, a lot of these groups are backed by government support. So they're connected and they're right where policymakers are thinking and talking about these issues and able to offer expert advice and opinion. So, um, you know, I think it's building that infrastructure where there's those those better connections is, is really critical. Yeah, and just absolutely agree. I mean, housing is becoming seen as a really important element in terms of supporting aging in place and, and aging, you know, well in one's community. So I do think that more awareness about these issues that uh, Dr. Mears uh, has, has just talked about um, are gonna be our way forward to helping to further combat um, loneliness and isolation. Thank you. Thank you to all three of our panelists today for taking time out of the day. I feel like we could easily do another hour. There's certainly enough interest and enough questions um, to do another hour, but we're a couple of minutes before, so we'll wrap it up and maybe we'll uh, we'll talk about uh, doing this again uh, next year. I think we will absolutely talk about doing this again next year. So uh, also a huge thank you to everyone who's joined us today as, as a participant. And thank you for all the great questions. Uh, Deanna is going to share a, a slide on screen now with the foundation's contact information. Um, on the topic of social isolation and what we can do about it, I do want to mention that we at the RTO ERO Foundation have developed a program called Chime In. And we launched this last October during Social Isolation Awareness Month. Chime In is quite simply an online chat group for older adults. It's open to, for anyone to join and to meet with and chat with peers. Uh, so we encourage anyone and everyone who's interested in meeting new people, um, having great conversation, um, improving maybe a little bit on your tech skills and your digital literacy. It's just Zoom. We're all familiar with Zoom now. Uh, explore our Chime In session. I'll ask Deanna to insert a link uh, for chime in into the chat box so if you look in the chat box on the side you'll get a link to get more information on our website and register and uh, it's just a recurring meeting and you can show up as frequently or infrequently as you'd like it's just an online chat so i encourage anyone who's looking for friends and conversation uh, to please try chime in so back to the webinar today um, i want to mention again or remind everyone that uh, foundation webinars are free to join all our presenters are volunteers they're donating their time and expertise as they have today. So again, a huge thank you to Dr. Raza Mirza, Dr. Rachel Savage, Dr. Samir Sinha for volunteering their time to participate in what I think was a fantastic panel discussion. Um, in order to help us continue to organize these great webinars, we hope that uh, everyone uh, participating today will consider supporting the RTO ERO Foundation with a donation. You can do this over the phone, through mail, online, our information is up on the screen right now. So please consider supporting the foundation. Thank you so much. So this concludes today's webinar. Uh, and thank you one last time to our panelists and of course, everyone for joining. Please stay safe, please stay healthy as usual, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you.